Here is a presentation on the inheritance of traits. We're talking about genes, we're talking about DNA. I thought this would be a good video to kind of review all the vocabulary that you've been learning to ensure that you really understand what's going on. With inheritance, the same root is heredity. Now heredity is the passage of something from one generation to the next. That could be taxes, that could be an inheritance of money, it could be a home, it could be all sorts of things. It's just when something gets passed from one generation to another, that's an inheritance and the process is heredity. This is also ap applicable to DNA. Or traits, as I can, you can see here. So what is a trait? That's something, a characteristic of an organism that could be detected in some manner. We've done the vocabulary in this, but I just want to make sure we understand that physical traits are, easily, are easy to observe or easily observed. They're related to appearance. Eye color could be a physical trait, hair texture, height, skin tone, just some examples for humans that are physical traits, things that we see uh, are all very much physical traits. Biochemical, now we've learned about what metabolism is, it's the sum of all the chemical reactions in the body. Since I'm mentioning chemical reactions, metabolism uh, can be a, there are aspects of metabolism that are biochemical traits. That could refer to something like lactose intolerance. There's a sugar in milk called lactose. If you can't digest it and it makes you sick when you drink milk, that's lactose intolerance. That's a biochemical trait. You're missing an enzyme called lactase, which is in your, uh, should be in your stomach if you're drinking lactose milk. Sickle cell anemia, we'll talk about this a lot more in the next chapter, but that's a biochemical condition where the hemoglobin, the, the protein that makes up your cells, will actually deform and, and make a different shape in conditions of low oxygen, uh, such as we're during exercise, and it can actually block small blood vessels inside your body. Cystic fibrosis, it's a lung disease. It's a biochemical condition where your mucus in your lungs becomes very thick and clumpy, and it becomes very hard to breathe. Uh, these are all genetic traits as well. We'll see what genetic means. It means you inherit these. So if you don't have the cystic fibrosis gene, you don't have to worry about actually having cystic fibrosis. Behavioral traits can be a little bit more complicated. They explain how an organism, meaning a living thing, would interact with its environment or with other living things. Shyness, obsessive compulsive disorder, like I have OCD, anxiety, depression. These may have some genetic component. They may have some uh, environmental component as something that you experience if something really bad happens to you then you might you know have anxiety from it or you might feel depressed from it so behavioral can be partly genetic but it also can be part of experience here's an example of a physical trait we have heights of lots of different famous people we can see Barack Obama right there in the middle next to Arnold Schwarzenegger you have the rock so this is an example of a physical trait, biochemical trait as I explained. Normal hemoglobin forms these nice little globules. In sickle cell disease or sickle cell anemia, the hemoglobin, because of a change in the genetic code, has a different shape. And that can cause potentially um, blood cells to block up blood vessels. It's very painful. Behavioral, now we do actually, as humans, we have a genetic uh, predisposition to be afraid of snakes. The nice news is, is about 50% of this is our DNA, 50% is our exposure. So if we expose ourselves to snakes, we realize snakes aren't dangerous. This is a boa constrictor, completely harmless snake. Then we actually can overcome that fear. So in some cases, especially with behavior, we can actually overcome our, our genes. We can overcome our genetic traits. Now, what is a genetic trait? It's a characteristic, a feature of a living thing that can be passed along as a result of a specific sequence of DNA. Your DNA sequence uh, determines what genes you have. And these are examples of um, traits that... Um, I'm sorry, I just had an email come and that distracted me. So these are traits that are a result of DNA sequences. They could be invariant. Uh, all organisms in the population would have the trait. 
Some DNA is that way. I'm just reminding you of the Velociraptor in Jurassic Park with the letters there. That's really what we're talking about. We're talking about a DNA code. But an invariant trait means all healthy members of the species would have a mouth. Uh, can a baby be born without a mouth? It's possible. Is it likely? No. Would that be a healthy person born without a mouth? No, definitely not. We also have variable things that can be different among healthy members of a species. So examples we would see, these are meerkats. They live in Africa. All of these meerkats, the invariant trait, they all have two eyes, they all have one mouth, they all have one nose with two nostrils, ears, four limbs. Those are invariant traits, things we wouldn't necessarily see differences between. Uh, same thing could be true for trees. Uh, the, all of these trees, there is some variation, but they all have a trunk. These are white birch trees. They all have white bark. They all have a trunk. They all have leaves. Those are invariant traits. If, it, if a tree didn't have leaves, it wouldn't be a tree. Um, at least, you know, it wouldn't be a tree that we would recognize because all trees need leaves to grow, um, to produce, to photosynthesize, to produce what they need to survive. So I would consider those examples of invariant traits. There, there can't be any change in those uh, for an organism to be healthy. Then we do have some variants. So you may not know, but broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage all come from the same original plant. It just so happened one variety of this was able to make leaves better. Even some made purple leaves. Some were able to make the flower buds better. Some were able to make the... I think this is some sort of a flower structure better. And we selected those different variants, in or those, those variables, in order to make these different crops that we see today. It's actually related to the brassica plants, the ones you raised um, as part of a lab. Another example of variation is ball pythons. I used to breed ball pythons. Uh, turns out they need a little more space than I have available. You can see they're all the same species. They're all... Python regius, the ball python or the royal python, but they have very different patterning and colorations, which are variables. Pigeons are another example of a lot of variation. When we get to talk about Charles Darwin, we'll see a lot more about these variables in the populations of pigeons that help Darwin start thinking about what evolution is and how it actually occurs in nature. This again should be review, but you do need to know the difference between a phenotype and a genotype. The phenotype is an expression of what is in the DNA. Phenotype comes from the genotype, but this is something you can observe. It could be a physical trait, a biochemical trait, a behavioral trait, but you actually can observe it. You can measure it uh, very easy. So in this particular case, we have three different phenotypes of mice. Actually, we have more than that because we're talking about one with dark colored eyes and two with red colored eyes, uh, but we have three different body colors. If we measure their sizes, one might be bigger than the others. There's different phenotypes that we're seeing here. The genotype is the basis for the phenotypes. The geno genotype, though, refers to the DNA code. In eukaryotic organisms, we have our DNA on many different chromosomes. If you remember, prokaryotes like bacteria, archaea, have one circular chromosome. If we have two copies of each chromosome, like we do, we are called diploid. And if we have two copies of the chromosome, each of those copies is called an allele. So diploid organisms have two copies of each chromosome. Haploid organisms, and yes, haploid organisms do exist, have only one chromosome for each set of genes. When we get to even human DNA, um, we have some examples if you're a male, you have one copy of the X chromosome, and you have one badly degraded chromosome called the Y chromosome. If you're female, you have two copies of the X chromosome. Now, humans are still diploid organisms, but um, in some cases, we only have one copy, one set of alleles if we are a, a male. And in the case of mammals, if you're a bird, you have two copies of what's called the W chromosome, and if you're, uh, if you're a male bird, you have two copies of what's called the w, w chromosome. If you're a female bird, you have one W and one Z, so you only have one, one copy. But that's for a little bit later on. What you need to know is eukaryotic organisms, which are the ones with a the nucleus, they have their DNA on chromosomes, and those chromosomes are within the nucleus. Prokaryotes have a nucleoid, but they don't have a nucleus, and they generally have one single 
one, uh, I'm sorry, one circular uh, form of uh, chromosome, whereas we have linear chromosome or linear DNA on our chromosomes and the process they're wound up around, um, this DNA is wound up around the chromosomes with proteins um, in order to form what eukaryotes have, which I'll show you in a moment. Now, in some eukaryotes, such as insects, we could actually see that females would have two copies of each chromosome, just like the, the queen would have two copies of each chromosome. I believe when Dr. Ware spoke, you saw she mentioned how males only have one copy of each chromosome. So this is an example of a eukaryotic organism where most of them are haploid, some of them are, I'm sorry, most of them are diploid, didn't mean to confuse that, I'm sorry, most of them are diploid, di meaning two, di meaning two, diploid, and some of them are haploid, they have half the number of chromosomes as a diploid. The male drones, if there's some kind of a defective allele, one that's not working properly, this drone will not survive, and male drones, bees generally do not live very long anyway. Diploid would be the ones with a copy, two copies of a chromosome, and therefore two copies of each allele. Haploid would only have one copy of a chromosome, or one allele. There are some other unusual examples in the eukaryotes. We can see here Xenopus lavis, the African clawed frog. One of the ones I had as a kid, I used to raise them. I actually even did breed them sometimes, but it is tetraploid, which means instead of having two copies of each chromosome, it has four copies of each chromosome. Amphibians in general, frogs and salamanders have very, very large uh, amounts of DNA in their genome, their total um, coding. So that's why something like an axolotl, the, the um, salamander that's able to regrow its limbs, we want to understand that process. It's a lot harder because amphibians just have so much DNA that we have to go through in order to make any sense of what's happening. Here are what the human chromosomes look like in general. Now, you've heard of the X chromosome and you've heard of the Y chromosome. Most of the other chromosomes, which we call autosomes, also have kind of an X-like appearance. Humans are diploid organisms. We have two copies of each chromosome. So one co two copies of chromosome one, two copies of chromosome two, two copies of chromosome three. We are diploid. These are called autosomes. I know a student mentioned autosomes. Autosomes are the ones that are not the sex chromosomes. Some chromosomes are very small. Some chromosomes are very large. All of them contain two alleles for a trait. If we're talking about how cells reproduce, there's two ways they go about it. Mitosis is when we make other diploid cells. So in mitosis, we make a copy. These are what the parents are. We make copies of each of our chromosomes, and then we distribute them evenly to our offspring. That is, can be used for growth. It can also be used for asexual reproduction. Now, I had thought that these GIFs would play as part of my presentation, but I see they're not. Let me try another way of going about this. They're still not playing, unfortunately. I did this on my other computer, and it turns out they didn't transfer. Well, what you would see here was a, an aphid that is making copies of itself through asexual reproduction. There's no need to put her chromosomes with chromosomes from another organism. This aphid just reproduces her, um, her DNA, her chromosomes, in order to make a second aphid. The second example here were fish that are actually undergoing sexual reproduction. So you see how the parent cell has a one copy, uh, I'm sorry, the parent cell has a cop, two copies of a chromosome. When those end up getting sorted out, the gametes, the sexual, the cells involved in sexual reproduction only have one copy of the chromosome so that one chromosome from the male and one chromosome from the female can go back and make another diploid organism. Now this was a pretty neat example where the female fish swims over, lays her eggs, and the male broadcasts sperm on top of the eggs to fertilize them. This actually was also shown in a, in a 
an episode of the Magic School Bus. I'll try to get these GIFs together. Maybe I can link them somehow. What you need to know is that mitosis will give you the same number of chromosomes that you started with. Meiosis will separate pairs of chromosomes, so you only get one copy of a chromosome in the gametes. That's the important thing to remember. These are haploid. They have half the number of chromosomes that the original cell had. With meiosis, we end up forming gametes. Gametes are the cells used in sexual reproduction. Now, sexual reproduction does not necessarily mean the process by which mammals engage in sexual reproduction. It just means that you have one type of cell, such as a sperm, meeting another type of cell, such as an egg. Each of them has one half of the chromosome, the total chromosome number that a healthy adult would. And therefore, when you have half from one parent and half from the other parent, you end up with an organism that actually contains the, the right number of chromosomes for the diploid organism to survive. And in most cases with a diploid organism, you get two alleles for each gene. In the, in the talking about humans, we, humans have 46 chromosomes. That's our normal number. Those chromosomes are actually 23 pairs. So what happens in humans when humans undergo meiosis, they split those pairs into single sets. So that instead of 46 chromosomes, and you have two chromosome one, two of chromosome two, two of chromosome three, two of chromosome four, you actually now have one set of chromosome one, one set of chromosome two, one set of chromosome three, and therefore are 46 chromosome karyotype or number of chromosomes we normally have is cut down to 23 so that when one parent contributes 23 chromosomes and the other parent contributes 23 chromosomes, you end up with a 46 chromosome uh, individual uh, that forms from that sexual reproduction. Chimpanzees, our closest relatives, have 48 chromosomes. Therefore, their gametes have 24. You take 48, you divide it by half, and you get 24. Now, this is Oliver the chimpanzee, which I, met, I mentioned during class. If you had a human gamete meeting another human gamete, you would have 23 plus 23, that's 46. That's what you would get in a normal human. Chimpanzee gamete would be 24 with another chimpanzee gamete, so a chimpanzee sperm with a chimpanzee egg would make 48, which is what chimpanzees normally have. For a time, Oliver, this chimpanzee who walked on two legs most of the time, was believed to be have 47 chromosomes, which would mean probably one of his gametes was human and one was chimpanzee, because 23 plus 24 would be 47. It turned out they did some extra checks on Oliver the chimpanzee, and he did have 48 chromosomes like any other chimpanzee would. He was raised around people and therefore he walked on two legs because he identified very strongly with people. Chimpanzees are still very intelligent animals, so if you're raised with people, you're going to think you're a person. That explains why he walks on two legs, and many of our closest relatives, the great apes that are our closest relatives, observe what people are doing, in this case, giving a bottle to a baby tiger, and then they want to copy that behavior. Now, this again was a gif that I had thought would transfer, but unfortunately it didn't. I'll see if I can post links to these GIFs so you might be able to see them outside of this actual presentation. I'll put the links in the comment section of this video if that's possible. And you can, and not in the description of this video, I'll put the links to these GIFs so that you might be able to see them. And I hope this is a helpful review for a lot of these vocabulary words. Thank you.